through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. I'm Spencer, and today I'm joined by David France. <laughs> I feel very, I feel very nervous saying it because I, I, as I told you, I just, I, I, the name is so, is so short. Like my last name is Fornishari, which is, I think, ten letters, and your entire name is almost that length. So it's one of those things that's, it's too short. It's deceptively short. Um, well, it's, it's the one I was given. So. Yeah, I, I would enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, you are the director of How to Survive a Plague, a film that's screening here at SIF, and then it's picked up by IFC it to is. be distributed later this year starting in September this is a, a pretty profound movie um, it covers the rise and I guess plateau if you will of the AIDS epidemic from the 80s and 90s and uh, honestly you know I was conscious of the AIDS epidemic but a lot of that occurred really before I was sort of cognizant I mean I was eight in 1990 mm -hmm. so I was familiar with things like the the quilts in Washington and um, you know Magic Johnson stuff like that but this really was profound to me because it really put a personal perspective to the whole course of events and you know the running list of people dying and stuff really was really intense the thing that really stood out most to me though was the footage like you have so much amazing footage in this documentary. It's almost hard for me to wrap my mind around. Like, it almost feels like it would have to be fictionalized because it's so well documented, like multiple cameras from like every event and things. Uh, how exactly did this film finally come together and why did it take so long to come together? Because it seems like a story that deserved to be told. Well, well, I should say for your for your audience that it's an archivally based film. Right. So yes, it, it is actually all real footage. Let yeah. me let me make that clear. It's not fake. It, and it's all found footage. I mean, it was. Um, I ultimately brought in footage from thirty three different sources, um, none of wow. whom, or or only a small number of whom, were actually working together. These were just individuals wow. who were chronicling this incredible historical moment, um, knowing how. In historically important it was and and knowing that what they were witnessing was was like it just you know revolutionary um it's really it's the story of this small group of activists who aids activists people with aids and right. their advocates who um responded six years into the epidemic uh and started saying you've got to do something and and then ultimately began to develop a, an idea of what should be done you know they they started just yelling at people and you see that at the beginning of the film and then they start saying they, they realized you can, in fact as one person says you cannot shout a cure out yeah. of a test tube no totally you've got to engage in the science itself so we watch them do that and and, and that's all in this incredible footage it, i mean it is as i said just the amount of stuff you have is just incredible i mean multiple cameras from events and stuff and it, this a large portion of it is about the group act up i mean eventually sort of you know Polit politics and different personalities end up splintering that off into a couple of different groups. And that's, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned revolutionary because, you know, somebody in the film sort of references, you know, good cop, bad cop. But the thing that occurred to me while watching the film is sort of, it felt like there were two sort of different pers personalities being driven. There's sort of like a Martin Luther King type one that was sort of work within the system, get everyone to work with us. That's how we're going to find the greatest amount of change. And then there was sort of like the Malcolm X uh, personality that like we, we need to get in there and change by any means, any means necessary. And I guess the two sort of driving forces of those different groups were, uh, was it Peter Staley for the sort of Martin Luther King good cop approach right, right. and Bob Rafsky mm -hmm. for the bad sort of cop approach. How significant do you think it was that they did both approaches and ultimately did it help that they did both approaches or did it at times heard it that they're doing it, both it approaches? Was, it was actually by design. Uh, you know, they, oh, called, really? they called it the inside outside strategy wow. because they were working all one organization unlike uh dr king and malcolm x right. who were working in separate um uh, edges of the movement really or separate um thrusts of the movement this was one movement and um 
And as they specialized through this 10-year period that this footage covers, they, they specialized in various um, fields. Um, and some became expert in management of message. Um, others in media uh, coordination and um, uh, and others in uh, social aspects like housing, mm-hmm. which was a, a problem for at the time for people yeah. with AIDS. I mean, and this really group, this inside group, um, in treatment activism, they called themselves the Treatment and Data Committee. And yes. they ultimately earned... Um, a, a place, you know, they, they like kind of barge through the door. You see it happen. They barge through the door of the scientists. The yeah. very first time it happened, we're there with cameras. And it's the crowd outside, the big street theater protesting, rabble rousing Malcolm X y right. sort of crowd outside that forces the door open for this group of people to go in. And I mean, I think the thing that I'm thinking about in terms of like possibly hurting it uh, ultimately as the movement went on was sort of. Yeah, once they start to get on the board of, you know, like NIH, National Institute of Health, and different groups like that, they realize that, you know, you can't shout a cure. And it's tough because, you know, all these people are living with this disease and, you know, people know people with the disease. However, it, you know, spider webs right. out. But it seemed like, you know, they realized that there was not going to be a simple solution. It wasn't going to be just like one miracle pill that was going to solve it all. And Part of them really understood that, and there was a part that was just so focused on, you know, we need to get a solution now that it kind of at times seemed to be a conflict as it went on because people weren't willing to listen to that, that like, okay, we're doing what we can, but it isn't going to be that solution. Right. Well, there there became a moment, and maybe this happens in every movement, but certainly this strategy, the inside-outside strategy, began to be suspicious of one Mm. another. The outside started feeling like the inside was becoming maybe too cozy with science scientists, too cozy maybe with the pharmaceutical industry. And the inside group felt like the outside group was becoming too mm, radical maybe, yeah. too um, too much in, in, in maybe overly involved in sowing chaos. Sure. And so the tech, the, the, the branches of this movement began to grow apart. And, um, and there's this just... Uh, incredible moment that that you would think would require a scriptwriter to create, right. where they're all in a battle in one room, yelling at one another, and then that that guy Larry Crane, yeah, oh, yeah, I remember that scene vividly. Who's, and this is found footage, you know, that it, the camera is focused on full face on him on a close up, and he just brings them back. Well, I mean, that's, them that's where you get the title of the film. This, yeah. this is a plague. He's screaming, like, why are you guys, like, shouting, this is a plague, and, like, this is doing nobody good to just sort of, like, break down. And that was one of the things, I mean, you know, it's it's easy to say, you know, this is a hyperbole to call it a plague, blah, blah, blah. But it's one of those amazing things when you have that counter on the screen literally showing you year to year how this thing is just – exponentially growing it's like oh 500,000 a million 2 million 4 million and it's 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 it really is terrifying to sort of think about especially from the perspective of the people involved with this and that was one of the most interesting things in sort of like this is a documentary but in a lot of ways I would describe it to people if they ask me as a thriller because you really I mean I don't know any of these people personally but I was certainly wondering like who's who's going to survive is anyone going to survive is everyone going to be dead obviously I mean there are a few there part of it was the way you cut it so that you know a few people like uh, was it a uh, Jim Igo like you know he lives because there's footage of him being interviewed now much early on but like a huge portion of the film you don't reveal what happens to these people until later on whether it's living dying whatever and it was really like it's tense because you're you're watching these numbers roll up and you're like you're starting to become attached to these people and what, you see them get sicker and you see oh them, yeah. you see the effects of the of the disease in them and you and you see them getting closer to the grave which is what it was like then that's why this using this archival footage um allowed me to tell the story in a way that was like living it again and you intentionally i mean i, I would assume kept a lot of that being revealed until the end because you wanted people to wonder what was going to happen to these people. Right, right. Um, how, how tough was that to balance, you know, like with showing people like Jim Igo and 
others earlier on that they had survived. Was there a time where you're like, I want anyone to be revealed till a certain point? Uh, I mean, obviously, a lot of you know the deaths and stuff didn't come. Think, I mean, right. until like later on in the in the 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 time frame you cover, which right. I believe is until like ninety five or ninety six. Yeah. Um, but was how how did you sort of balance who you were? bringing up to date and why you're bringing them up to date and stuff like that i did want to try to n- not use anybody mm. um in, c- in contemporary interviews i used two people and very sparingly um two people from that time jim Igo and um garance frank ruta both of whom are hiv negative and um both of whom were there as advocates for people wow with that's interesting and and i want i felt like i could let you know that they were that they were alive, um, and they both gave such tremendous interviews. This kind of um, that they understood in their narrative as we sat down together the the huge uh, universal um, um, you know triumphalism of what was going on there and and what how it played significantly in historical perspectives. I mean, it's interesting to see the uh, the story of the especially the individuals who are featured in the movie but one of the things that was most profound to me was when the film ended and you know there's like eight million people dead at that point or 10 million 8.6 8.6 8. yeah. 8. and 96. at the end you say you know two million people are still dying from AIDS a year and that was the thing that almost resonated as much as anything with me is that you know okay eight million people 8.6 million people is an incredible amount of people and yet Two million people are dying per year still, and it's almost like a forgotten issue at this point. How how can how can it have gone from something that's so profoundly on the attention of everyone to uh, so so much on the back burner almost? It's Is it crazy. just because it's, it's not crazy, in America right? anymore it's so crazy. much? It's well, more African we're, now. We're still places. losing thousands of people a year in the United States from from AIDS. I mean, you know, I think at the figure seven thousand people a year dying from AIDS. <laughs> In the United States, every year, um, and why? Why are they dying? Most are dying because they don't have access to the drugs that could save their lives. The drugs that make AIDS not an automatic death sentence anymore, that make mm. it a survivable condition, um, and we just don't talk about it. It's, Two it's million shocking, people a yeah. year dying now is more than we're dying in the in 1995, 94, and, 93, and the and, worst years of the epidemic. And that's the thing that was so shocking to me is because it's like, oh, yeah, you know, yay, the plague is over, so right, to speak, or right. at least the end of the movie is. Right. And everyone's like, you know, we we survived. We're like here or whatever. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just like two million people. That's, it's as bad as it's like ever been. Like yeah, it's, worse, it's crazy worse. to think that it's still – it's just almost a forgotten issue. Like I, I, I just couldn't believe that. I uh, broke that number down. You know, it's – that's four people every minute. Wow, that's dying that's... dying of AIDS. What would it take to save their lives? Pills that cost a dollar a day. Oh, that's that's. I mean, that's that's, that's just tragic to even think about. So it was interesting. You mentioned like Jim Igo and was it um, who's the other Garance Garance um, not being HIV positive. I didn't I didn't even realize that while you're while watching the film. But I mean, that's really interesting because one of the other people that really deserves note, another one that wasn't. AIDS, uh, HIV positive was Iris Long. And I think that was one of the most interesting things about the movement is unlike, you know, um, civil rights, which it really isn't applicable to because this is a disease and that's not. But this actually took it from purely a protesting perspective to actually getting involved with the scientific part of the disease. How how complicated was that actually, that evolution, do you think? Because it seems like, you know, it, 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 there just happened to be a few really smart people, at least in the beginning, like Mark Harrington, who seemed to click in terms of reading this data and right. her sort of breaking down all this sort of information. How how profound of an impact do you think it was that they finally took that into their own she, hands? She's one of those, like, accidental figures in history that, you know, I think – so many historical moments pivot around somebody who kind of just wanders into the middle of an historic moment. Yeah. And this is a woman, Dr. Iris Long, um, a retired pharmaceutical chemist um, who lived in Queens with her husband, very kind of working class woman. She dressed 
funny. She had the, the funny Queen's accent. Um, and she, when, when AIDS activism began, she thought they should know something about the way drugs are developed. And she had never met a gay person in her life. She took the train to the city and she showed up in this room full mostly of gay people, mostly very fashionable, mostly very young, mostly very sophisticated. And they came from the arts. They came from culture. They, and she stood up in the middle of this room and she said, you know, what you people are, 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 are doing in your movement is, is putting your focus on getting underground drugs. Mm. And you're trying to get drugs that people are experimenting with in, in Israel, in Europe, in, in places where we don't even know what those drugs do. Right. And the mistake that you're making is to try to do an end run around the system. The system is where the doctors are. The system is where the knowledge is. You want a drug that ultimately will be proved effective through the mechanisms that are currently existing. So she gave, she began to give these lessons in, in, um, in how the NIH works, how clinical trials are done, how uh, the FDA works in its regulatory um, capacity. And at first, people had trouble hearing her um, because she was, it wasn't about, it wasn't about these anger demands. Right. It was about a methodology. And ultimately, we start seeing people like Jim Igo, who was the first to adopt her message as being important. And then uh, Mark Harrington, and then the creation of this this group of people who, who under her tutelage and with her encouragement began this intensive, uh, self-directed scientific study to teach themselves aspects of virology and immunology and, uh, and, and, and clinical research in such a way that they could actually not only just parrot the language or understand the language when it came back to them, but that they could develop uh, clever new ways of thinking about things. Well, I mean, not only that, but they, they also sort of changed the way the entire system works, not purely yeah. just the for the drugs that they were interested in, but like just the way, you know, the FDA went about. That was Iris, Iris's idea. Wow. Iris said, you know, the, the FDA does not need 10 years to approve a drug. It was 10 years from the time a drug was discovered in a test tube before it would get into a medicine cabinet. And she said, you know, why does it have to be that way? And, um, and but she didn't have the answer. It took these guys, you know, Garantz, a high school dropout, Jim Igo, a, uh, an experimental playwright, yeah, Mark Harrington, funny. a film archivist. It took these guys along with um, Peter Staley, who was a bond trader and um, uh, Spencer Cox, who was an actor. It took them all to come together to say, you know, let's see if we can find the answer. And what they came up with was a novel reinterpretation of biostatistics that that showed that you can test a drug in six months, a year, 18 months, depending on the drug, in a broad enough group of people that you can develop an answer that's significant um, that will actually tell you if the drug is working and if so, how it's working. That was, it, was, it, it, was, it was amazing. Huge, a huge contribution that's still being uh, practiced in exercise today. Yeah. It's just amazing. No, it, I mean, the whole, the whole story was just an incredible film. Uh, for those who are not, in, sadly, at SIF and cannot see the film now, uh, is there a website or someplace that people can find more information about the film and about, you know, say, what they can do to perhaps help the two million people die in a year now? Absolutely. We're uh, How to Survive a Plague on Facebook, and you should come and you should like us. Push that little button. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, howtosurviveaplague.com. And in terms of you personally, where can people find more information about what you're doing. I know you're an author. Uh, this is your first real elaborate film project that you've been involved is, with. Yeah. Do you have any other books or films in the works that you might want to let people give a heads up to? Or is there a Twitter or an email or a website or anything that they can... Oh, I'm at davidfrance.com. And, right, and as, although it's a short name, it's spelled just like it's the country, awesome, France. Yeah. Um, and I am working on a book, thank you for asking, about um, uh, uh, this same period of time, kind of going oh, deeper into what the science is and, and how science was really transformed uh, as a result of this. Uh, this is really the first time science has ever really taken a virus, a virus, and brought it into submission in this way. Um, that had eluded science for a hundred years since it, the discovery of viruses, and it took these citizen scientists to do it. And I mean, without getting into, like, conspiracy theories, like, I've always wondered about, you know, the whole concept of, like, curing a drug versus, you know, treating a drug. And, it, I mean, it's, it's, it is an interesting to think about that, you know, people 
who had the illness during this time period are still alive today. Absolutely. It's kind of an amazing thing. Um, well, thank you so much, David. Right. And you, you can see more interviews at MacGuffinPodcast.com. Thanks. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.